Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 179 of The Criminologist Podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. In the vast expanse of criminal justice, the men and women dedicated to probation and parole services play a pivotal role in both the rehabilitation of clients and the safety of our communities. Their work strikes a balance between accountability and compassion, making a tangible difference in countless lives. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with someone who's not only been at the forefront of these efforts, but is also poised to lead one of the most influential organizations in this space, the American Probation and Parole Association, or APPA. Marcus Hodges, the president-elect of APPA, has graciously joined us. With a rich tapestry of experiences, ranging from the Court Services Client Supervision Agency, more commonly known as CSOSA, to his notable tenure as Regional Administrator for the Virginia Department of Corrections, Marcus is a seasoned expert with a vision for the future of probation and parole. As we navigate this conversation, you will get a first-hand look into the initiatives and priorities that Marcus envisions for APPA, the challenges and opportunities of probation and parole in the modern era, and the role of innovative technologies and practices. You will also hear reflections on a storied career and, for those aspiring to make a difference in this field, some invaluable advice straight from the helm of APPA. So, Settle in and open your mind as we embark on this enlightening journey with Marcus Hodges, diving deep into the world of probation, parole, and the promise of a more just and rehabilitative system. Now, please enjoy my conversation with Marcus Hodges, and I will see you all on the other side. Yes, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you tracked me down at APPA as I was coming out of the restaurant and said, Joe, Joe, what have I got to do to get on your podcast? And here we are. Before we roll up our sleeves and get into it, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience more or less to let them know what your pathway was, what your trajectory was, which led you to the stopway in life that you're at now. And then we'll roll up our sleeves and get into some of these great questions. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I mean, I've been, I've been a fan of your podcast. And just the fact that I saw you, I was like, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to ask. All he can do is say no because he's so famous <laughs> and you were so gracious to take me on. So I'm really excited about being a part of this. So my name is Marcus Hodges. I am the, currently I'm the associate director for the court services and defender supervision agency in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm going to date myself. 32 year career in corrections. Um, started out in maximum security prisons, actually as a rehab counselor back in 1992 out of college as a rehab counselor. And then I, I made parole to go over to community corrections. And in my entire career, I've done both. I've done institutions and I've done uh, community corrections. I will tell anybody I can, do my, I can do both. My love is community corrections. The chance to work in community and collaborate with people and to see the effects of change on people. I love that 100%. So, a 32-year career in corrections. I'm also the president-elect of the American Probation and Parole Association, and I am the past president um, for National Association of Probation Executives. So, I'll tell you throughout the podcast, I am a firm believer in, in, in working with associations that really advance and work in our field to make our field better. Congratulations on your on your president-elect status with APPA. We look forward to your tenure. What do you think your 
bringing to the table with your previous acumen, Marcus, between, as you mentioned, Virginia Department of Corrections, your work with CISOSA, the Court Services Client Supervision Agency there in D.C. What do you feel you're going to bring to the table in your new leadership role with APPA? I'm a big collaborator. I mean, I, I think criminal justice agencies, we do a good job of coordinating. We don't really collaborate. And, you know, we talk about evidence based practices and we talk about collaboration and, and really work together. Um, I think there are entities out there that have shown that collaboration can produce great results for us, great outcomes for us. I don't think we collaborate well. I still think at times we're all stuck in our silos trying to do the best thing we can do under, under the mission of what our mission is. But I don't think we cross over and collaborate to produce the best results we can. So I think one of my, my primary mission is to collaborate with anybody who has the same values. And that's really to improve communities, reduce recidivism, and reduce victimization. That's what we're going to be about and collaborate around those things. I had a guest on recently. We talked about the struggles of correctional reform and correctional implementation even. And he echoed your sentiments. He said, you know, we basically have 50 probation departments in this country sewn together trying to do their own thing. But then when people wonder why as a vocation, we can't sort of get our act together here in the United States. That's one of the problems is because so many systems at play here at the state level. And then even within the state level, there's, there's, as you know, different systems, we have County state, the feds. So it's a big monster to, to get a hold of, so to speak. So kudos to you for bringing that spirit of, collaboration and I would argue really just transparency transparency rather about what's going on and and what's working and and doing a better job of touting our successes so others can share from those positive experiences. I agree with you 100 percent I think the main thing when I talk about collaboration is we don't have to do it all. I mean in some entities probation is doing it all. They they're they're the social workers, they're their Department of Behavioral Health, they have the law enforcement aspect of it. We do not have to do it all. So when you're trying to do it all, are you really good at anything? And and, and my whole thing is we're really a, about change. Helping people change their lives to be productive citizens, give them the pathways, create pathways for them to change, be that conduit for change. But when I'm trying to do fifty million things, I can never be good at what I'm really intended to do. And that's why collaboration is very important. Exactly. It reminds me of what's known as the hedgehog principle, which which goes something like this. There's a mammal, the hedgehog, that's been around for thousands of years because it does one thing and it does it well. When it feels threatened, it rolls up in a ball and hides. And you're right, we're, we're too many jack-of-all-trades. And I think that's the issue is we have to get a unified vision of really – even who we are and what we're about, that I've been having a lot of engaging conversations as of late about that old colloquialism in probation and parole about wearing two hats. And I've started to question that and ask myself, do we really? I mean, what's the value added of that? Or is it just adding confusion to the practitioner to decide what hat am I wearing versus no, you wear a change agent hat. Don't, don't, struggle between these two worlds between social work and law enforcement and when you're what and when you're whom we need to redefine our role and sort of crystallize that role moving forward hey look let me tell you what that argument for years has gone on probably since the start of probation and parole supervision and still goes on and and so my early argument my, my argument coming back i said we're balanced i would say we have, we have to do both now i'm to the point where well that doesn't fit anymore. We're not balanced. We're neither. We're change agents. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and part of our role, part of our role in the change agent, there is a law enforcement component and, and there's a social work component. But at the end of the day, we're change agents. You know, I mean, so I, I really think we, we get caught up in that argument and some people want to lean left and want to lean right. And then it becomes political and then it becomes punitive. And then it says the pendulum swings everywhere where well, that pendulum is swinging and there are people hurt because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, and even at the individual level, Marcus, these are just my observations, but I think that mantra, if you will, of, well, we wear two hats, it almost gives license to the individual practitioner to gravitate towards whatever style that may be. So in other words, if we have a more conservative officer, they're going to rely on the, well, we wear two hats, four days out of five, I wear the law enforcement hat. Or on the flip side, you may have somebody 
more in the in the social work cap, thinking, yeah, I wear two hats, but four days out of five, I'm a social worker. And the client isn't going to benefit from that. Our stakeholders aren't going to benefit from that. We need to clarify our role a little bit better, I think. Throw the hats away and be who we are. We're exactly, changing. Exactly. Exactly. Totally. exactly. Yeah, and, in, and in this argument, in this discussion, in this right now, and said the hats are gone, you're this. Because here's <laughs> the thing. Being a change agent, being a change agent is not soft on crime. Matter of fact, holding people accountable is more crime reducing than anything in the world, but giving people opportunities where they can thrive. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. I mentioned APPA, the American Probation and Parole Association Training Institute, which we just had in lovely New York City. It was amazing. Share some of your key takeaways or even transformative ideas that, that you were presented and how do you think they'll shape the future of probation and parole? Well, there, there's, there's a couple of topics. I mean, the, the, the conference was phenomenal. And if, if, if you didn't go, you missed out. But there's another one in Seattle in February that we'll talk about later on. Uh, but it was a great conference. Uh, one of my takeaways, um, we had Larry Miller. And Larry Miller wrote, wrote a book from, called Jump. And really, it's about a story about redemption, about a, a person that committed a crime Years ago, confessed it later on, got a man's, made a man's with his, with, with the, with the victims and a real, a, a wholesome story about how, um, redemption works in our spaces. And this man has done everything. This man works for Jordan Brand and, 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 and has made a lot of money and is a great guy, but his story really touched the heart of officers. And also, I think the story was the impact officers have. When officers show empathy, when officers show, you know, I'm invested in you, when officers make those statements, then he said that made him feel great. He didn't want to fail. And it wasn't, he didn't want to fail an officer. But when officers act like they didn't care, guess what? If you don't care, I don't care. Why should I care? So that power of the tongue and how we speak life into people was very powerful. And we had that testimony throughout the whole conference. I think given the platform for those who have had lived experiences, and allow them to give us feedback on the supervision process is huge. I think for years that voice was silent. It was silent among all of us because it's like we're directive and how we we know best. We don't want to hear from you because if you knew best, you wouldn't be where you were. But now we're opening up under the guise of collaboration of hearing different voices of how we can improve our system. I mean, so those two takeaways from there were very powerful. I agree. When I was debriefing the experience with colleagues who weren't we're not fortunate enough to attend. I had the same takeaway, the the uh, the spotlight, if you will, on those with lived experience and finally sharing that perspective as we should have a long time ago. I often tell the tale of it's like if we got all of the medical professionals together in this country to reformat the way we deliver medicine, but we never talk to patients. Nope. Or we got a bunch of education specialists together about how to reconfigure the way we deliver educational interventions, but we never talk to the students. It's just, in hindsight, so so, so backward that we wouldn't hear those voices. And yeah, Larry Miller, great job. I also attended the plenary in which Jonathan Fisher screened his amazing documentary in a whole new way, which also leaned into that concept of sharing the perspectives of those with lived experience. It was really all about perspective taking for me. Yes. I mean, it, I, I'll tell you what, I was, um, I'm blown away about the conversations that we can have. And I think, uh, I'll give you a prime example. We had the Reform Alliance and um, Jessica Jackson spoke on Saturday at, at the, the, we had the Women's Executive Summit. And, um, you know, when people talk about reform, they want to reform probation and parole. People are like, ah, those people, those advocates. But we can have a civilized discussion on the on reform and probation and parole, and I don't have to I don't have to take offense to anything they say because here's the thing: most of the things they're saying we agree with. Ninety percent of what they're saying we've been trying to fix for years, and we know what's wrong with the system. So why will I take offense when someone else outside says it when I already know it's broke? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hundred <laughs> percent, Marcus. <laughs> I'm a big evidence-based practice champion. Regular listeners of the show will know that. We know that the American Probation and Parole Association plays a vital role in advocating EBPs. How do you envision enhancing these practices, especially when you factor in the diverse needs of our clients on probation or parole? 
I'm glad you asked that question because we had a great conversation about the re-engagement of evidence-based practices. And what I mean by that, um, we our work really shifted during COVID. I mean, our work really shifted during COVID. And we had to um, cut some corners and we had to do things because we had a pandemic. Well, two things happened with that. Number one, it showed that every correctional agency across the country, community corrections or corrections, they can change on a dime. For years, we said, we can't change. It's like turning the Titanic. It takes time. <laughs> Every one of us changed in two days. When the country shut down, we said, we're out. We're done. It's over. <laughs> we, ch- we wrote policies. We wrote procedures. We changed our business. Right? We did every- We did telehealth. We did all this stuff like this. And I'm thinking, well, I thought we couldn't change. So then, so then it showed me that we can change. Um, what I am leery of is that this whole notion, we know the evidence-based practice is if, if we do it with fidelity and we do it well, it produces our desired results. But I'll be honest with you, I don't know how many people are doing it well. I think we pick and choose the things we do. We got a risk instrument. Oh, we're doing evidence-based practices. Well, just because you have a risk instrument doesn't mean you're doing evidence-based practices. And, and, and so it's like after coming out of this pandemic, how can we push evidence-based practice in a way knowing that we just made these changes real quick to get to those outcomes where people can fully implement all the practices. Because I don't think we're there yet. The devil's in the detail with implementation. You're absolutely right. I, I often tell people, nobody's reinventing risk needs responsivity. We've known about it for 40 years, 50 years. It, the devil's in the details with implementation signs. And to your point, it gets lost in the weeds. I often talk about also because there's a zeal like you said to almost check that ebp box but i sometimes have a love-hate relationship with the fidelity principle i i clearly understand the importance of if you're going to do this intervention this off-the-shelf program you have to do it as as it was intended but we get so almost tunnel visioned i think sometimes that it inadvertently becomes kind of a weird one size fits all or square peg round hole. And the practitioner doesn't see the forest from the trees. No. With all due respect to my good friends at the, at the NIC, the national Institute of corrections. I know, for example, that in their trainer guide for thank you for a change, it will coach new facilitators. Hey, if you're, if you're, if you don't have your sea legs yet, Go ahead and just read this script word for word. And I've seen people read these scripts word for word, and I read the room, and none of the clients it's, are understanding this. It's not resonating, but they so they feel so fearful to remain uh, to maintain fidelity with the program that they won't improvise, they won't change it up, and they're thinking this is how I've got to deliver the Kool Aid, or it's not going to sink in. I don't know if you know Dr. Rafael Ventura. He's with LA County Probation. He, Rafael and I were having the conversation about this recently, and I loved his takeaway. And I said, I'm going to steal this, Rafael. But he said, We have to be careful because people think evidence based practices are a silver bullet, but not all of our clients are werewolves. <laughs> we have werewolves and vampires and mummies. So you have to contextualize these EBPs, or it's almost just really defeats the purpose. So you got to tailor them. I mean, so, tailor so, so I tell people this, you are so right. Um, I, I, I think what, what happens with that, and I, I get the fidelity piece. I totally get the fidelity piece from the academic standpoint, but then I'm the practitioner mm-hmm. and practitioners know everything is great. Mm-hmm. And, and while you may have the, my, my intent may be this curriculum and get through this thing today, this person is hungry. This person has a fight with his girlfriend. Something is brought up in there. And if I don't address that right now, then I'm not going to get anything out of it. And, and it's like, so we create robots to do this cognitive behavior programming. But I need someone who can decipher when to do this and when to do that and use that as a guide. I'm not saying to go there. And I know when I say to people like Marcus, no. But at the end of the day, when you're in the field doing this work, I have got to meet people where there are. And sometimes I got to punt. We'll still get to the end. I mean, so I, I get it, um, but I'm also a loosey goosey guy anyway. I'm a great guy. I'm not going to lie to you. Well, and we have to be. Our clients are complex individuals with complex risk and complex needs, and they're not the, the, 
the cookie cutter template that the designers of these interventions utilized when they when they came up with these evidence based practices. Hey, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the role of technology in probation and parole, which I think I saw Joe Russo get an award at APPA. Joe's an amazing guy. Yeah. How do you see APPA integrating modern technology into into what we do? Just overall, I guess. Uh, we, we t- you talked about how it was sort of baptism by fire <laughs> with the lockdowns and COVID and our reliance on technology as far as things like remote contact and stuff like that. But what role do you see APPA playing in how we integrate – emphasis on the word integrate, tactical solutions without compromising other things we do, clients' rights, ethics, things like that. Like that. Well, let me, let me tell you, we're going to lead the way. I mean, uh, Jerusalem has done some good work. And, um, and we're, we're on our, our technology committee um, for APPA. And we, we did some work for people they've experienced, but this whole notion of technology came up. I mean, so I look at the pandemic. Uh, we use FaceTime. We use uh, Skype. We use WhatsApp. Any 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 mechanism. And then we also did poll surveys with our population during the process. And so what we discovered early on was that our clients actually preferred to FaceTime, and and, and they they preferred to FaceTime. We had longer, meaningful visits. Our collateral contacts doubled. Our our groups that were doing through telehealth had a, almost a ninety percent completion rate. All because we use technology. So why is that? They came back to say, well, we feel safer, number one. We we're, we're, we're don't have to cross neighborhoods or sit in a group with someone who I think may shoot or kill me or something like that. I can be authentic on this on this screen. And, and so it was a lot of success. So I think we've got to continue to lead the way in that because I'm fearful that we don't, I don't want us to go back pre-pandemic. And now we're going to bring everybody back to the office to do this work, which we know there has been so much gains as far as technology. But the whole use of AI, AI is intriguing to me. And, and, and so I saw a, a demo in New York where they, they gave AI these four criminogenic factors. Okay. And, and it did a case plan and almost did a PSI based on four criminogenic factors. I don't think my staff, and I'm, I'm not going to get y'all, they couldn't write a better one. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> it gave the roadmap. It was freaking right on just using four criminogenic factors. So for me, how can we get out in front? Because AI is not going anywhere. It is here. How can we leverage AI in a way to make our outcomes and our supervision practices better? I love that you brought up AI because I have gone down the artificial intelligence rabbit hole. Our other APPA tech guru, Jason Marinas, who serves on the same subcommittee with Joe Russo, turned me on to AI, and he and I have had some really engaging conversations. And I have to choose my words carefully here because I never want to take anything away from the great work that our practitioners are doing, but more to, as you said, how can we use technology to better serve our clients? And I think, yeah, when I look back, I'm an old codger like you. I started my career back in 1988. We didn't have computers back then. We did all our, yeah, I did all my chronological case notes in my left-handed chicken scratch handwriting. So I've seen how technology has evolved. And I don't want to say it as a, you know, it's going to take jobs away kind of thing versus it's going to take off so many of those administrative duties off your plate that you can focus on what you should be focusing on, which is establishing that working alliance with your client and then via the responsivity principle, endeavoring to find out how to best tackle those needs to get you on the pathway to desistance. But I think if we have a hard and honest look at what goes into a 40-hour week week, and you mentioned report writing or even the administrative minutia of sending snail mail letters to go to a chemical dependency evaluation or please report to the office by Friday, blah, blah, blah. And AI can do so much of that like that. Well, you know, you think about this. So there's not a product probation pro department in the country that does is not having a recruitment or retention issue. Mm-hmm. I mean I mean I mean so case those are skyrocketing in some cases. So what can technology do? How can we leverage technology 
to, to negate that. And then so there's a bunch of administrative tasks that technology and AI can assist. So if I'm having a recruitment issue, I, I, I can I can cover from using technology. And I think that's where we hit it. I think that's where we have to hit. And yeah, and again, focus on the things that the human touch is necessary for. Like I said, those relational pieces that are so important to the process of of desistance from crime. Well, you're right because look, if you look, if you do a time study in most probation pro departments, more time is spent administratively than working with the client. I mean, everybody knows that. And if anybody just want to tell me that's different, then I want to come visit your shop and show me what you're doing differently. So how can I negate those administrative tasks so my officer can be in the community, engaging with people in the community, engaging with collateral contacts, engaging with our clients so they can be successful? That's where I want them to spend the majority of their time, not doing administrative tasks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mark, as I've been mentioning desistance from crime, which regular listeners to the show know what I'm talking about. For for the uninitiated, in short, our current risk need responsivity framework really examines assesses and then builds interventions around those pathways into crime commonly known as those criminogenic variables whereas on the flip side those in the desistance camp got the bright idea hey why don't we examine those pathways out of crime and what they discovered was they're not all the same. So in a sense, we're really missing half the equation. I know you've done some work with our mutual friend, Dr. Ralph Sarin, around the Dreyer, which is one of his assessment tools designed to measure those desistance correlates. But talk about your experience considering desistance with your staff there, particularly at CSOSA. And just how you envision maybe broadening the the lens of how we how we view the populations we work with to consider both of those lenses, if you will. That that that's a that's a great question. I mean, first of all, we wouldn't be where we were today if it wasn't for Dr. Ralph Sarin and his work with the Dreyer. I, I've been watching the Dreyer for years, and I always loved the Dreyer, and 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 now I get the opportunity to work with the Dreyer. And, and the thing I love about the Dreyer is, is a couple of things. I've talked very early about the notion of enhanced protective factors. I mean, so, so for me, we look at risk and we look at the risk as, as, as this individual 18 to 24 can be African American male automatically high risk because 18, 24 African American, I'm gonna high risk. But if that 18 and 24 year old lives with his mom or was incarcerated and got a college degree, education, there are factors there that lowers the risk. And most risk instruments won't, won't, won't look at that. They won't look at the factors, the, the positive factors that things have done. The flip side is this. I've had people who are older who come out um, medium. They have high needs. But even with the needs, they have went through a divorce. They don't have a stable home. That risk should go up. The thing I love about the Dreyer is it meets people where they are throughout the supervision period. Because people are not, people don't stay still. Good things happen in their life. Bad things happen in our life. So how do we create supervision plans to deal with people? Because all of our lives are up and down. I mean, don't don't think this is about our clients and we just think our, it's just our clients. But all of our lives are up and down. So as an officer, how can I get my officer to understand that and really meet the client where they are as they go through the pitfalls and downs and successes of life? So we engage that way. I mean, so if someone lost their job, and they're coming in and losing their job. Okay, how can we engage them so they can get their job? First of all, the question we ask is, why did you lose it? And what happened? What were the factors that got behind? And we don't do the talking. We do the listening. And then what we try to do is, what what are we going to do next? So now I have this client talking about, okay, yeah, I messed up. I, I showed up late three or four times. They told me now I couldn't do this again. And now we are engaging them in a way that is almost a pro-social type engagement. Instead of saying, you lost your job, you're going to get another job, I'm going to lock you up, or I'm going to violate you. You better. It's a different type conversation because we're change agents. So the beauty part, back to the Dreyer, is that it meets people where they are. When a person gets a GED, we should be celebrating that. If they get college, we celebrate all of those things because those are accomplishments just like you and I. So my thing is, how would do we humanize the supervision process and don't think it's us versus them because I always tell my staff if you were on the other side 
we were going to have the same conversation with you. How do you want that conversation to take place? Other thing I'll talk about this is what we failed miserably at years ago, and I think we're really good at it now, is we didn't take uh, into consideration stabilization factors. We, 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 didn't, we didn't take into uh, of, of, of having good housing, uh, of having a place to eat, and those factors that people need right away. And, and now that's one of the first things we look at. Before I jump you into a cognitive behavioral program, before I say you need to do all this, we try to stabilize first because we've had a lot of failures by doing just the opposite. If we don't stabilize first, that cognitive behavioral intervention is not going to be effective at all. It's a waste of your time and my time. But if we can stabilize them first, find them stable housing, give them food, if it's mental health, give them treatment, then I can do my dose of cog. That's going to change behavior. So it's really a a humanistic approach to supervision where I think years ago we weren't. It was cookie cutter. You do this, you do this, you do that. Well, and I can throw myself under the bus as far as it was cookie cutter. And again, I had a stranglehold on fidelity, if you will, because out of the official R&R playbook, you would look at those stabilization factors that you just articulated as as responsivity considerations. But it almost was like an afterthought because it was just beat into our head of the big four, the big four, the big four, the big four. And the other thing that you pointed out, and I learned this from Dr. Saren as well when he was training me on the, on the Dreyer assessment tool was – That tool is much more sensitive to change versus the traditional R&R tools we look at, which are historically done on an annual basis. But if you think about, and you pointed this out when you said, clients are like us, we have shit going on in our lives all the time. Well, so do our clients. And if you use those traditional R&R tools, which only capture a snapshot of that client's life on sort of any given Sunday, whenever that assessment's done. Think about that everything that can change in that client's over the next 364 days before the PO gets the alert, oh, I've got to do a reassessment. That client could be assessed and get a, a medium or low risk score on, a, on an r and assessment tool. And the next day they get fired from their job. And then they come home and they tell their girlfriend they got fired from a job and he she she says, You're a bum, I'm I'm kicking you out. He's so upset, he's so heartbroken, he goes to the bar and now he relapses. But because that assessment was done last week in his probation officer's office, he or she is operating under the, the view of that snapshot on that given Sunday of the assessment. Whereas the Dreyer is designed to to be done every 30 days, every substantial visit to capture those sort of roller coaster changes in a client's life that the PO should be should be addressing. It, it really is about due diligence if you think about it that way. You are you say the example you gave is what happens probably throughout the country. And here's the thing, that case is probably medium. In most cases, they're probably saying either once a quarter, every other month. So all these things have happened, gone on, and you won't know until your quarterly or bi-monthly visit or whatever you do. All these things. And then we wonder why people fall off the rails. The, th- mm-hmm. the thing about the Dreyer, you use this tool every 30, but you also show the client. Yeah. I want the client to know where he's at or she's at. I want to share it with them. Well, how do I get that? Well, these were your responses. Do you disagree or do you do agree? So you're having this ongoing evidence-based conversation, not just with ourselves, but we're having it with our clients. So now they are in tune to their success. Yes. Yes. Marcus, if you think about why, like not to bring gamification into this, but even think about, you know, the weight loss apps on our phone or the, or the electronic wearables we watch that give us those sort of nudges, like congrats, you've reached your goal. Here's your ding, 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 ding bonus, whatever they're giving you. That's human nature. That drives us to do better. Imagine if you or I, or any of our listeners out there were undergoing a personal change initiative and it was, all right, Joe, start your new intermittent fasting regime on September 1st, 2024, and we'll see you in a year. We're not going to give you any updates on how it's going for a year. 
versus those positive reinforcement nudges along the way. But to your point, that's kind of how we supervise clients when the that normative feedback they get based on their assessment is annual. But in the meantime, we're just coming at them with all the degradation ceremonies and celebrating their failures and all the non-compliance and stuff because that's just sort of vocationally how we're hardwired. But we, but we wonder why. I mean, because now I can show you I mean, I mean, I only know the Dreyer because we're working with the Dreyer. And so I'm not, you know, I'm just, I can show you pitfalls. I can show you successes. I am with you every step of the way. And I'm sharing this information with you so you can control your own life. It is not for us as the officers to control your life. I want to show you the pathways that we got. So when they're engaged in that, and, and most of them are like, whoa. I mean, they can't believe what we do and how we do it and how they do. And now they want to do better. Well, how can I get here? And now when I reward them by reducing supervision levels based on the things that they have done and taking some things off the plate, because at the end of the day, I want them to be productive member of society. I don't want them to have to have, be on supervised probation. I want you all living a crime-free life, doing everything you should be doing. That's what we want. So the less is more. I can, I can come tight, but I'm trying to less and gradually get them on their way to get off. The thing and you know this from working with the Dreyer, it does incorporate those protective factors like you pointed out. So when you review it with the client, it's not just the traditional, here's all the 43 shitty deficits in your life that this risk tool told me about. It's like, no, I'm improving my identity or my cost rewards perception of criminality, things like that. It really becomes a participatory thing and not sort of a judgmental, this is wrong with you thing that the client dreads the reassessment because it's like, tell me how crappy I'm doing again today, Joe. You you just said something. So think about it this way. Antisocial peers. Yeah. You want to talk about antisocial peers? Let me show you what protective factors are. They're very protective. Mm -hmm. I can take that criminal jig need right there and have a conversation with the client that the importance of having a mentor, Mm -hmm. having people that care about them, not the antisocial peers who don't care about you. I can have and show them that when they have these positive people surrounded around them, good things happen. I can show it through science. I can show it through everything else. I am addressing a huge criminogenic need just by showing the protective factors version of it. Yeah. If nothing else, you're right. If we just sort of flipped it around like that. But again, I think many of these tools are just too binary and they don't capture the grayness, as we said. Even with with peers, which we know is a huge criminogenic factor, right? But I sometimes think it's almost, again, too shallow or, or doesn't dig deep enough because it doesn't take into consideration the fact that somebody who's thrown into that so-called antisocial bucket when it comes to scoring the orbit of individuals in a client's lives, some of the definitions we use – I think need to be dusted off. For example, if I'm interviewing a client and I'm doing a sociogram to sort of capture, as I said, the orbit of friends and associates, if you look at the so-called user's manual and you see things like, well, we met in jail or we met in prison or I I met him in a, a relapse group, we train staff, social learning theory, they're going to model negative behaviors, score that as risk. But when we talk about, for example, we talked about how APPA last year really leaned into leveraging lived experiences. I know there's been a trend with utilizing what's known as credible messengers. That would throw that formula out the door because one could argue (laughs) At least if the if the assessor didn't dig deep enough, those individuals, those credible messengers would be deemed antisocial because of some of those user manual textbook definitions of how should I define this person? Risk or no risk? Risk, no risk. Maybe talk about your experience with credible messengers to shine some light on this, this topic that I'm trying to articulate here. Yes, no, you, you did it fine. I think we need to rethink this. I mean, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you two stories real quick. So I was at a, um, uh, 
it's a program we had, we had in my in my hometown, and it was really talking about local reform, criminal justice reform. And they had about uh, fifteen guys returning citizens. Uh, um, all of them served a lot of time. About three or four of them had their turn their sentence overturned um, because they were wrongly convicted. They all knew each other. They all knew each other, and all of them would say, "This is such and such." He was my mentor when I was when I was down. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I was today. He kept me straight while I was in prison. And it was this mentorship, this pro-social mentorship that I saw. And they took this group picture. But to go back to what you're saying, it, we need to rethink this. We need to, re, we, we need to freaking restudy this. So then in every major metropolitan city, you have these people called violence interrupters. And they're using lived experience people to go to the neighborhood yep. and a comp. And everybody's hiring credible messengers that assist with the supervision process. We need to do some better research on that because I think that's an outdated philosophy that's not relevant today. I mean, and, and, and so um, I don't know any emerging work for that, but from what I see through my lens, and it's anecdotal, I know we got to do more we research on this, I think that tide has changed. Now, I'm not saying across the board that's always the case all over, but we had this notion. It's like sometimes probation. I'm just going to be controversial, Joe, in a second. It's like probation... We haven't got out of the 70s. We, we still think what happened in the 70s and 80s as it affects client change um, is the same thing. And, and times have changed with social media, with technology and things like that. We need to rethink some of our practices that we used in the past. I had a great interview. Boy, it's probably been a couple of years now that the great Brad Bogue was on the show. Yes, the I know show. Brad. Yeah, Brad's been a, a mentor of mine for years. Brad is brilliant. Brad is brilliant. And we we did a great episode. If listeners want to go back, I want to say it's in the 70s as far as episodes go. But we did an interview and the topic was reexamining the needs principle. And we just kind of looked at where the field has come since, God bless them, Bonten Andrews cranked out the first edition of the Psychology of Criminal Conduct. And we talked about a lot of these things. And one of the things he brought up, and I just thought about it when you were talking, was it's not so much that the tool or the theories were wrong, but in Brad's opinion, a lot of it comes down to the issue of differential diagnosis and that the probation officer, as opposed to a full-time therapist, full-time clinician, just doesn't have the capacity to, again, differentially diagnose. So the case that you just mentioned with the, the the individuals that all had offended together at one point, but now we're desisting together. And, you know, I'm sure if, if, if Jim Bonta were on the call here, he would say, well, let's think about GPCSL, general personality, cognitive social learning theory, and, and, dig down into the weeds of those relationships, then yeah, that would probably get get worked out in the wash. But back to Brad's point about differential diagnosis, it's just too difficult to train up and build capacity for most POs to see that to see that subtle difference. And they're just putting them in that I always train, you know, what side of the risk fence are these variables on? The risk fence or the no risk fence? But it needs it needs to be reexamined. That also reminded me when you were talking, Marcus. Are you aware of an outstanding documentary out of Scotland? Actually, the Road from Crime. Road from Crime is an outstanding documentary. It was produced by Fergus McNeil and Shad Maruna, and they do a great job of interviewing folks with lived experience who've desisted from crime. They also talk to academics. So, Fataxman's featured. In the documentary, John Laubot of Harvard University is featured in the university. But at one point, they come from, they go rather from Scotland to Baltimore, and they're talking about some gentleman who, when there was the heroin explosion in Baltimore in the 70s and 80s, they offended together. They started using drugs together. But then, voila, they desisted together. And it does a really insightful way of, illustrating what you and I are talking about here. And they make the point of desistance can be contagious. Just like when you look at 
social learning theory, which is the foundational theory really behind the risk needs responsivity model. And we talk about, yeah, when you model these delinquent behaviors, whether it's through delinquent peers or a dysfunctional family relationship, yeah, that, that delinquency can be contagious. Well, flip that same spirit around and they've discovered desistance can be det- contagious too. But Again, I think it's a vocation. We're so deficit-driven that we just look at playing whack-a-mole with these risk factors and don't consider – you've been doing a great job of it, Marcus. Let's augment these protective factors and not just check them out of box in the risk assessment when they ask, is this a protective factor? Check. And then put it in the file cabinet and not operationalize that information. That's called the the evidence-based practice checklist. That we yep. do, and, and and under the guise, and then you'll get an audit, and everybody says, "Well, you know, we practice evidence based practice," but I always say, "But do you really?" Mm-hmm. I mean, do you do you really? So I say, as a practitioner, I always say, "Connect peers to purpose." Yep. And, and, and see, the more peers I can connect to purpose, they, they become mentors. And here's the here's the thing: we have a um, our field is full of egos, and I'm gonna be sometimes we think people can't survive without us. Well, I, I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want that thought process. I want them to survive without us. I'm not going to put us out of business because we'll never be out of business. Yeah. But how can we connect peers with purpose so that they can engage, so they can walk the path themselves? And, and all our job is to support, coach, and guide. That's the role of the officer: support, coach, and guide. Speaking of which, speaking of pathways, talk about pathways for success. Oh, baby, hey, hey, this, this, this is my baby. I mean, so. You know, we always try to figure out what are some pathways for success in, in supervision. And we, we've done some out-of-the-box things. So first thing we did was, um, you know this because you're a practitioner. You know everybody on probation, especially young, wants to be a rapper. Everybody wants to write a They sit in jail and they have nothing to do and they start journaling. And interactive journaling is a great, great cognitive behavior program. I'll tell you that right now. But they want to rap. So how can I meet people where they are? So we ended up partnering with a uh, local DJ named Easy Street, and we created a music academy. So we created this studio music academy where it didn't cost us much money, where they were able to write their lyrics, but it's a cog-based program. Meaning this, you couldn't get in this program if you didn't follow your officer's instructions. If you had the drug test, you had the drug test. Everything that was required for you had to do, but if you did this, you got to this program. At the end of the program, we shot a video in your neighborhood, a rap video that's online. It's online, so we had to watch. We had to worry about the words, but we we clean that up. But that was one. Of our, that's our first step into meeting people where they are. Now, no one has become got rich over a rap, being a rapper. No one has. But people of that class is a hundred percent full all the time. He does life skills. He introduces yoga. He introduces them to a whole world of jobs. Everybody works. And the whole notion about connect peers to purpose, when they graduate, they come back. So we're in our fourth or fifth cohort of that and just simply meeting people where they are in supervision. It's a great out-of-the-box program that we created. So that was one. I think the other thing is to get into this vocational world of how we can teach our young people for jobs and careers. I mean, so we always push education. If you're reading at a third or fourth grade level, and I'm only always on supervision for 18 and 24 months, the likelihood of you graduating in that time frame is not going to happen. Uh, but we can be parallel tracks. So how can we create vocational opportunities where you can work, get a certification that can lead to full-time employment and work your education? Once again, pro-social activities that we're creating for them. And what we discovered when we do that, my cognitive behavioral therapies work very well because if you don't do this, you can't get this. So everything is a parallel track meeting them where they are. So just different pathways that we created. I really think you're onto something there and maybe we can all learn from that. It's about, again, not necessarily building a better mouse trap, but just maybe, I don't know, slapping a fresh coat of paint on it. And I love what you're doing there with the that group. You said, and I can relate, everybody wants to be be a rap star someday, but if it If it taps into their passion and gets them excited and you sort of, as you said, backdoor the cognitive behavioral interventions in there, then why not? It reminded me, I just mentioned Rafael Ventura when I was visiting him recently. We went to some facilities 
out in Los Angeles. And in one of them, Campus Kilpatrick, they were really utilizing technology specifically around virtual reality. And in short, they were using VR, VR headsets to teach kids COG. I mean, on the surface, there's a line for these kids to put these headsets on because on the surface, it looks like you're fighting dragons and trying to level up. But really, the dragon is, for example, illustrative of your anger or antisocial thinking. And you've got to slay the dragon, so to speak, using emotional regulation or the other things we teach them on a chalkboard in a classroom in a juvenile detention facility and can't figure out, boy, Marcus, why isn't, why isn't this COG homework sinking in like the folks at NIC told me it was going to do? He wasn't practicing it in the right setting. Exactly. Thing. And that's what I meant about putting a fresh coat of paint on the mousetrap. It's like, let's not throw everything out. Don't throw out the babe at the bathwater, but just talk to the customer, duh, and see what's going to resonate with them. Hey, we, we know our script. So we know, the yeah. route, we, we know the route where we want to go. It's just at times I have to have them drive the car. And, and it's, yeah. it's like when you I learn to drive and the instructor has a wheel and you have a wheel. And I got to brake and, and, and they got the gas. And I can hit the brake and, I, and you're, you're driving because it's your life. But that whole notion of, the, I mean, you talk about technology early on, that VR headset, and we've seen components of this in which, like teaching COG, and you put them yeah. in real life situations that can occur in the neighborhood and you see how they're going to respond to that. Yeah. I mean, that is a great test site using real life experiences and you get great feedback, just not just from a piece of paper, but they have to act it out because it's right there in front of their face. The other thing that was an upside to using the virtual reality headsets was, again, you're removing the child from the traditional classroom setting where he's surrounded by his peers and, and you've got a classroom full of class clowns, Right. No one's going to raise their hand to volunteer. No one's going to be the teacher's pet. But in the privacy of those headsets, they learn. It's got me thinking now, Marcus, you know, we know that at the end of the day with these cognitive behavioral interventions, it's all about getting the client to understand the thought behavior link. I'm sending out a a call to action, listeners. All right. (laughs) You just have to come up with a, a mechanism to instill into your clients the thought behavior link, whether it's the program you just described or something along the lines of what they do with VR. But let's get creative and just think of whether it's storytelling or media or technology. Get 100 people to come up with 100 great ideas. How would you tell or, again, impart upon someone the value of their thoughts and only their thoughts control their behavior? And then we just build it up from there. I, look, I, I tell you what, your listeners do that, we got gold. I mean, because here's the thing. Everything that we're talking about, I mean, the VR sets cost something, but we can create it. It doesn't cost a lot to meet people where they are. Our clients tell us every single day what their needs are or what they want. How can we meet them there, give them what they want with some assistance, but then also get what we want? I mean, it's like it's no different than that. It's a shared case plan. I mean, but 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 do we? is it really shared? No, because we don't listen to them. I mean, so... And it took me it took me a couple of years to listen. I ain't gonna lie, I just didn't get here, so I get where people are. But I I found our success is just really simply listening to people what they want. And if we can guide and give them those tools, hey, hey look, man, I, it's the best thing ever. I know one of our sites in the Southeast that we have, we, we put a, a a PlayStation there. This was years ago. Everybody thought I was crazy, and I said I just I, I want to create an environment where people can come here and not think and not see the outside world. Where they can just think, gather their thoughts. They're having a bad day. It's hot out there. They need to just get away. Just something. I need a in a base, a safe space base, and that's what we were trying to create just for them. Now this was all pre-COVID, but we created that, and now we're trying to recreate that. But we actually created that space virtually, because the virtual space is the safest space ever. Even when I talk to practitioners, as you said, who were forced to do their home visits virtually, they they did pick up on how, yeah, there was a more sense of, of safety and, and trust. And it was, okay, Marcus, you're not here under the guise of a home visit to check up on me, but you're really looking around the house for empty beer cans. And if I've got any paraphernalia or whatever, 
Yeah, exactly. I think we should learn from that and really, really leverage those experiences. I think we can do both. I mean, I, I tell everybody it's, it's almost a hybrid. I mean, so people will say, well, markets, we got to get, yes, we have to cross portal still. We got to, because you build, I'm a relational guy. I mean, so the, the relationships that we build can be built using technology and can be built in, 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 in public pace of seeing people. How can we do both? When I was a little kid, I would date myself here again. We would spend every Labor Day, summer winding down, watching the Jerry Lewis telethon. And I remember after the 24-hour te- telethon, my dear mother would point out to me, you know, Joey, the very next day, apparently, Jerry and his producers, they're planning next year's telethon. This is a year-long event. You mentioned Seattle. I know we just got out of New York City, but I suspect it's the same as Jerry Lewis used to do. Plans are already afoot for Seattle. Could you give our listeners any any insights or something they can look forward to for next year's APP event in Seattle? Well, I'm excited about Seattle, and you're right. We take a week off, and then we start planning. And, and matter mm-hmm. of fact, it's funny. We probably start planning before New York or for Seattle. The, the biggest thing we have for Seattle is we're going to do an executive leadership summit. We did one a few years um, in Miami a couple of years ago. That was phenomenal. And now we're going to replicate the one we did in Miami. It's going to be in, in, in Seattle. And it will be for executive leadership. I mean, there's there's not a lot of executive leadership and community corrections summits that we have. And so the, the first couple of days, we'll just bring in executives, 150 executives from across the country, diverse, to really talk about the state of community corrections. And really have that conversation and, and, and really have some leadership principles. We will be dipping our toe in AI with some demonstrations around AI because a lot of people are asking about technology and the future of community corrections. So this will be the futuristic conference where you will see a lot of notes about technology. We're in the Microsoft Capital World. We're in Seattle. We're out there. So yeah. we are going to be digging into technology and AI. I love it. And Seattle's a beautiful city as well. I'm really looking forward to it myself. Finally, Marcus, for our listeners who might be considering a career in probation or parole or even a deeper involvement with the great APPA, what advice or insights can you offer? First of all, everybody's welcome. I mean, and every voice is needed. And I don't care where you're at in the pendulum. We already killed the two hats, so I'm not going to talk about that because we killed that. About half <laughs> we an crushed hour it. Ago. We crushed the hat thing. Everybody's needed. I mean, I'll tell you what, I spent 32 years in, in this career, and it's the most... Uh, I'm excited for the future as I was excited from day one. Our field is, is ever-changing. It's ever involvement. I remember uh, Director Clark from Virginia, Harold Clark from Virginia, always say the work that we do, it, 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 it's almost noble in a way, of the, of the impact that we can have on changing people's lives and, ch- and changing community. It's noble work. And, and, and I, I believe our profession is headed in the right direction. I think we have ant. We have questions to more answers than we can give ourselves credit for, but also we don't give ourselves credit for the work that we do every day because for years we've been on the tools of we're just a secret service, we're behind the scenes. And now you're starting to see community corrections become to the forefront of probation and parole supervision of having an impact, not only changing people's lives, but changing the community. I'm so excited about our future, but we need everybody just to, to line up and show the world what we do every day. Speaking of the future... Marcus, I often ask my guests to look into their crystal ball and imagine if I have you back on the show in, let's say, a year or even five years, what do you think we might be talking about then? Hey, uh, hey, I I, I think with our recruitment, retention issues, I think we're looking at workload and things like that. I I think you will see a big push in artificial intelligence in 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 our field. I think we've got to be careful and I think we need to, it's okay, it's like GPS. All right, GPS is, uh, is, is, was, got out in front of us, of the practitioner. And we, we all know that. And GPS vendors know. And I ain't telling them no secret, nothing like that. However, under the world of AI, we can't have the same mistake. We got to get out in front of that. How can AI benefit the supervision process? And we need to get people together to have that conversation. And that's what I'm looking forward to. So we can have practitioners, people that are well with technology. And how can we create packages that people can use together before it gets out in front of us because it's coming no matter what. Well, count me in. I can look back on some of the technologies over the years in which I was a laggard and late to the party. And I specifically told myself when AI was all over the news, all right, Arvidsson, you're not going to be a laggard on this one. You're going to be a champion, be the tip of the spear. So count me in, Marcus. I'm, I'm with you. 
on that journey as well. Hey, look, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I think um, it should be interesting. I think we, 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 with case management systems, GPS, we've done technology. And, and now you've seen how GPS is evolving. They got apps and everything else. And, and we, we're accepting yeah. of all of that. Yeah. So now that we're in, it, we're in it, I think right now we need to drive it a little bit. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Marcus Hodges, president-elect of the American Probation and Parole Association. So glad we had this conversation, Marcus. I look forward to having you back on the show and or seeing you in Seattle and or some other iteration or collaboration. Be well, my friend. I be well, and thank you very much. All right, take care. Reflecting on our enriching conversation with Marcus Hodges, a central theme emerges that challenges some deep-rooted notions about the probation and parole landscape. Our exploration of the two hats concept illuminated a paradigm shift in the way we perceive probation officers. Gone is the outdated binary of oscillating between a law enforcement or social worker role. Instead, as Marcus and I discussed, today's probation officers are best understood as change agents. It's not about enforcement versus empathy, but about embodying a role that champions positive transformation and community integration. The change agent cap represents a holistic, forward-thinking approach, integrating the best of both worlds to achieve a rehabilitative and just system. Technology, particularly the potential of artificial intelligence, promises significant advancements for this domain. However, its true merit lies in its ethical and discerning application. The onus is on harnessing its capabilities without undermining the rights and individuality of those under supervision. Dr. Saren's Dreyer assessment provides a refreshing perspective, highlighting the shift from solely identifying risk factors to accentuating the protective factors in a client's life. This comprehensive approach recognizes the inherent potential within each individual, underscoring growth, resilience, and positive transformation. And with the forthcoming APPA event in Seattle on the horizon, there is a palpable sense of anticipation, not just for the wealth of knowledge and connections, but for the united drive to progress and refine probation and parole. To our dear listeners, thank you for sharing in this voyage of discovery today. Whether you are a current practitioner, an avid learner, or someone eager to understand the nuances of our criminal justice system, we hope this episode enriched your perspective, a perspective steeped in hope, community ethos, and the enduring possibility of change. Until our next rendezvous, remain inquisitive, stay informed, persist in being an agent of positive transformation, and always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. First of all, we wouldn't be where we were today if it wasn't for Dr. Ralph Saren and his work with the Dreyer. I've been watching the Dreyer for years, and I always... Love the Dreyer, and, and, and now I get the opportunity to work with the Dreyer. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.